All right, so our, our first panel is entitled, uh, We Are in Align, Are We in Alignment with Our Communities? How we define community can vary greatly and is influenced by a complex mix of social, geographic, environmental, and economic factors. Our first panel will discuss how communities function today and whether current municipal government structures are aligned with that reality. So uh, I'll introduce all three panelists first. And uh, Dr. Bill Ashton is with the Rural Development Institute, RDI, at Brandon University. Dr. Ashton's work on rural issues has explored topics as diverse as watershed management, housing needs analysis, crime prevention, and uh, community economic development. In 2013, RDI reports uh, titled Indicators and Criteria for Strong Rural Municipalities and Identifying and Explaining Self-Contained Labor Areas Inform Government of Manitoba Policy as that province moves forward with municipal amalgamations. Uh, as well, we have Dr. Kevin Jones, Acting uh, Director, the City Region Studies Center, the University of Alberta. Dr. Jones has a background in the social study of science and society, environmental uh, sociology, and uh, policy studies. His current research explores the relationships between technological innovation, urban development, and community participation. The City Region Studies Center engages the communities to explore the nature of town, cities, and regions with a goal of increasing understanding of the cultural, political, economic interactions and interdependencies within these social spaces. And as well, in the middle, we have Craig Copeland, uh, whom many of you, I'm sure, recognize, Mayor's City of Cold Lake. I've had the chance to interview him on the show as well. After one term as a councillor, Mayor Copeland was first elected mayor in October of 2007 and is now in his third term as this rapidly growing community's chief elected officer, Mayor Copeland, has been a vocal advocate for the need to take a more modern approach to municipal uh, government, one centered around the concept of a complete community that incorporates urban centers and their rural counterparts as a community node where people live, work, play, and uh, do business. So, Dr. Ashton, how about you take it away? Great. I was bringing the uh, slides up. Um, again, thank you uh, to the mayor and, and uh, just to be here. It's great to be back in Alberta. Um, I've spent 12 years here in an earlier life of mine, um, and it's, uh, it's great to, uh, to have such a, a gathering um, talking about community and talking about the evolution of local government um, in a province and often in many ways leads Canada in terms of what's happening here. I'm hoping to draw on some of the research as, um, as, as introduced in terms of uh, this notion of self-contained labor areas. Um, and I also want to sort of start with uh, sort of two notions, two propositions that I'm, I'm presenting. I've got 10 minutes to do this. Um, so one proposition is, is that um, I think increasingly communities and the definition of communities needs to be revisited. And so I'm hoping to be able to, to offer up an, a way to look at um, how the boundaries and fundamental to communities is, is our boundaries. We get our identities, the economy, and everything else is around that. So I want to see what that looks like in terms of how would we redefine some of the boundaries if we were to do that. In Manitoba, we're doing that and it's happening and I want to show you what I have offered up to, uh, to the provincial government there in, in, that, in some of those calculations, if you will. The second proposition I'd like, like to put in front of you is, is that I think the go forward for most municipalities is going to be built around partnerships, both formal and informal. I'm not telling you anything new around that, but increasingly I think it's the ability to not only just work with your neighbours, but increasingly work with other organisations that m might in fact be halfway around the world. So on the partnership side, and you'll hear that a couple of times again, I think from the panelists in terms of the importance of partnerships. Um, this notion in general often talks about bottom-up initiatives. You're familiar with that because you're closest to the people and often it's top down. Sometimes those are negative notions and sometimes they're positive. I think there's a spectrum and I think that spectrum is often around power and influence. Um, sometimes you have it and sometimes you don't depending on what you're doing. So if you're um, active in local partnerships, you might place that around bottom up. And if you're involved in an annexation, you might place that on the spectrum of top down. An amalgamation fits somewhere possibly in the middle. You can figure out where those lines might be uh, for your own situation. Um, 
that's how I think of them in terms of that power and influence. You've got lots of controls locally. Um, as you move up that, uh, that scale, if you will, um, possibly less and less power and more and more provincial um, 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 decision making. If we're going to talk about local partnerships, um, and certainly that is central to this, there's often a spectrum of local partnerships as well, um, going from coordination, cooperation, as well as collaboration. Um, it, it at some point may in fact test the, the local autonomy. How much decision making are we going to either keep or give up um, as, you, as you start collaborating from tax sharing and everything else. Okay, so I want to now just turn to and look at amalgamation for the, for the Manitoba situation. And often this question, as it was with the standing committee of the legislature, um, over three evenings, uh, six hours each evening of presentations, um, often in amalgamation, we talked about why not amalgamate. And there was few talking about why. I think it needs to be talked on both sides. There's lots of those. So if you were thinking of amalgamation, is there any hands of where you would start of why not? Could you think of a reason of why not? Why not amalgamate? Is there any reasons why not to amalgamate? Uh, this is a question to you, so you have to hold up your hand. <laughs> any, is there any reasons why not to amalgamate? Even one hand would do. Okay, we've got one hand. And is there reasons to amalgamate? Can you think of a reason to amalgamate? Yeah, okay. So there's some that are willing to say yes to that, sheepedly so. Um, so in listening to the stories, the why nots, uh, that list actually goes on for about five slides. I'm not going to do that to you. The whys often are much shorter and, and well-defined in terms of what's happening. From there, it really was for us trying to figure out, okay, if, if we've got a, both pros and cons of, of the amalgamation story, um, how might we start looking at aligning the territory because it's a fundamental building block of community. Um, and I'm suggesting it's from the functional regional point of view that, we, that I've looked at that. I'll talk a little bit about the chronology of this negotiated partnership with the province as well as the local partnerships. If we look at the territory, both in, in Manitoba and, and across Canada, Stats Canada and the province have been very diligent over the last 20 years to define economic regions. But those regions are too big for a, a local municipality to figure out what the communities are. So what if then we aligned the boundaries of municipalities of where people live and work today? So, Although you think you know your community, and I think that was the case for over 100 municipalities in Manitoba, I'm about to show you some statistical work that allows a redefinition of local community. And in Manitoba, they did, or in Canada, they did this with Stats Canada using 2006 data, and they moved from um, an urban-centered region, which is often the notion of the region, the, the rural area is part of the urban trade area. This analysis says um, we think there's viability of looking at rural communities and starting locally and moving out, and it's based on where people live and work at that travel distance. The more people that live and work between the, uh, the census subdivisions, the stronger that relationship. And Monroe did this for, in the first time for, in Canada analysis in 2011, <coughs> excuse me, and created um, these these groupings of municipalities. The problem is, is that there was very large database and, and we needed to refine it for Manitoba for the particular application for Manitoba. Why did we have to refine it? Because in, in uh, 2012, um, the province through a throne speech said we have to address our rural municipalities needed to be over a thousand population. We had over 80 municipalities, those in yellow, all in the southwest, all less than a thousand. Municipalities knew that they weren't obeying the law and the provinces know that they weren't meeting the law. Now what to do? Um, in the, the white area is Winnipeg, so that's another rural area, but it's situated around cities. The other rural is the north. So there's three, typically three rurals in Manitoba and we're talking about primarily the southwest. 
The top-down notion was is there was a chronology. Throne speech, the minister was very active in, in a number of, of letters getting mayors saying, we are going to do this. The province said, here's some guidelines. Here's where we're going with the story. And we have to figure out, you have to figure out the, the, the partnerships that you're going to, to work with. The province is not going to impro impose on that. The, from the bottom up, the municipalities had to make decisions about who they were and were not going to partner with and how they were going to move forward. When we completed the analysis, we actually borrowed Stats Canada Monroe. Uh, we worked with her in Ottawa for this analysis. We took 106 municipalities and we were estimating it was going to be about three dozen municipalities if they were grouped together relative to where people live and work. Um, and I know that you'll hear more today on, on the amalgamation story because there's lots of, of views around this. But it was a beginning point of the conversation. At the end of the day, as of August, so that started in 2011 or 2012 in November, um, municipalities had to submit their, their amalgamation plans to the minister. And currently, as of August, there's an election coming up in October 22nd in, in Manitoba. Um, what we had is, is that there was uh, four um, of them agreeing SLA um, um, self-contained labor areas. Four of them were exactly as we predicted. Um, 36 of them were actually in smaller areas and we anticipated that, that they wouldn't be such large areas. And nine of them, and this is where I want you to think about if you were one of the nine municipalities. So, so there was a map that the province used in, in their publications about if you're going to do this, here's generally what it might look like. And there was nine municipalities that decided to move beyond those and actually go, if you will, against the flow. And I'm trying to figure out why that is. And so we, we can't do that as researchers until after the election of, of, the, of, of August or, or of October the 22nd. But that presents a, a real interesting um, um, challenge for us. And they ended up with 47 municipalities total. So 106 municipalities are now being proposed and have accepted, and they're now down to 47. They're suggesting the amalgamation it was a negotiation, and that's the story. Um, it started in 2014. They started to saying, who are we going to partner with? What is our name? Um, in 2015, they had the name, the CAO, and then they had to move forward to um, give it a couple years. And by 2019, then they had to, to complete that story. Last slide. Um, the last slide is, is that there's um, the idea that there's local boundary or the, the local boundaries can in fact be, be composed of where people live and work is the beginning of that conversation. I think the functional economic rural regions have something to say about this to inform the discussion rather than to dictate it. Uh, municipalities have to be involved in this from the bottom up for the decision making. I also think that the province also have to need, need to do it as well to initiate the conversation and help set some of the guidelines going forward. It's certainly a negotiated process, and as an icon suggests here, as our graphic suggests, there's nothing natural about amalgamation typically. Um, so let me leave it at that. Thank you. I'm going to be trying to operate two machines here at once, so forgive me if I start lagging behind on one while I'm clicking another. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to speak with you today uh, about a very impor important topic. I think for Albertans, municipality is an important time and, and thanks Mayor Given uh, very much for the, inv uh, the invitation. How we create appropriate systems of governance for contemporary municipalities is an issue which a great deal of scholarly attention has been paid attention to. A great deal of scholarly attention has been paid over a great many years. Um, instead of diving into the depths of this, or even um, presenting some of my own research, I'm going to take the opportunity of speaking with you to talk about some um, more general trends uh, within the literature and the way in which we think about um, cities and regional systems of governance. Um, and I hope to provide, uh, in doing so, a context uh, 
shaping the need for adaptation, as well as some of the challenges to evolving governance in Alberta. Over the past two years, I had the pleasure of working with a group of um, academic colleagues from around the world to produce uh, an edited book on the topic uh, of governance reform. Uh, I, I just preface it because much of what I'm going to talk about is deeply indebted to their work um, as opposed to, to directly related to my own um, areas of expertise, and I'll make reference to them as we go through. When we first sat down to, I told you, when we first sat down to, to think about this project and, and to look at the challenges ahead, um, we started by noting a really significant tension uh, within the field. On the one hand, um, we're seeking to create practices and institutions of governance which offer the concrete means of addressing the challenges faced by today's municipalities, yet we do so with a toolkit in which our core concepts are fragmented, uh, contested, and, and, and very elusive to define, or even to find in practice. Uh, it's necessary then, citing my colleague um, John Harrison, um, to work beyond captured concepts and to make a commitment to complexity and as I shall argue throughout the, the rest of my talk to embrace experimentation. In fact, there's no toolkit to apply uh, but rather the task is giving meaning to these ideas through practice uh, and through an openness uh, to change. I've organized what I'm going to say into two challenges or two roads that kind of need to be negotiated on the way to change. Uh, the first, as I've mentioned, in terms of embracing complexity, and second, um, the means with which we work through complexity to find the appropriate institutions of governance to meet the current and future needs of our cities. The quotation that is up uh, in front of you is drawn from an influential annual report um, on the state of the world cities published by um, UN Habitat. And where Alberta's municipal governments might traditionally have been involved in a number of well-defined and clearly delineated policy areas and service responsibilities with well-defined boundaries and functional geographies, the quote there suggests um, a transformation in the extent and the breadth of the roles uh, we understand cities to have in our society. Um, I think it says, oh, sorry, got to yell, yell at me. Um, the idea that cities are the engines of human development as a whole is very different from the cities responsible for plowing my street. Traditional municipal commitments to infrastructure, Planning and local democracy, of course, remain central. However, such roles are joined by a myriad of further responsibilities, previously unimportant or under the purview of other levels of government. A good example uh, can be found uh, in the city of Edmonton's kind of proliferation of the strat strategic areas that it's involved in. If you're not familiar with this, this is, these I think are all of the way we's um, uh, that the city put forward. And within each of these areas, um, ranging from uh, growth planning, development planning, transportation, we find all kinds of other areas of policy which cities might not have previously been too involved in. Food and food security strategies, science and innovation strategies, all kinds of different areas um, that cities are now taking a strategic lead um, and trying to use their influence to, uh, to change. Well, this has implications then for um, how... Sorry, I'm lagging here. So it has really important implications then for the challenge uh, of municipal um, uh, cities and, and what they do and how we want to have them adapt. Um, the rise of the city in the urban uh, form as an appropriate spatial scale or unit of governing the complex issues described in the last slide um, is really important um, to consider. Perhaps most obviously, policy expansion and the growth of our cities challenges our municipal capacities. I think we can easily see this. Uh, cities, particularly outside our larger urban areas, struggle with having the professional capacity and the expertise to deal with things. We struggle, um, and we hear about it routinely and daily in the press, about the lack of um, finances and sources of revenue to fund new areas of policy development. And very often, we work in policy areas which straddle um, different other levels of government. But moreover, the diversity and complexity of the issues cities are engaging challenge traditional spatial definitions of the city, or more plainly, the difficult challenge of where to draw your boundaries. Instead, current strategic policy developments imply multiple boundaries, shifting over time, 
usually outward, and very often contentious across wide ranges of issues and communities. Complexity means that the boundaries of urban governance are necessarily imperfect and in flux. And so I'm going to give you a few examples, and I apologize for bouncing around here a little bit in the slides. So this, this comes from the City of Edmonton Municipal Development Plan. This is part of the food and urban agriculture strategy that is first proposed there. And we can already see that the idea of, the, of what the city is now extends um, into what was previously seen as the, the hinterland or these peri-urban places. Um, some people call these kind of hybrid zones in which mutual dependencies uh, mix with different cultures, different values, different ideas about what we need to do with those lands and the different futures we envision for those parts of the landscape. That's an example. Economically, we've known for a long time that our economic well-being and our economic development isn't dependent within our, the boundaries of what we do within the boundaries of our cities alone, but they uh, matter regionally, who we're close to. So there's two examples there. One is a conurbation between Manchester and Liverpool. Liverpool, the, the historic trading port, Manchester, the source of manufacturing. Um, both absolutely dependent on each other for each other's survival. And so when we start to talk about economic development planning, it doesn't make sense to talk about economic development planning for Liverpool. Uh, at the time of the Industrial Revolution, or um, to talk about it only in terms of Manchester. The other example, of course, is, is the San Francisco Bay Area, a more contemporary uh, economic zone. And then thirdly, we increasingly in the academic literature find people talking about what scholars call non-contiguous kinds of relations. We understand that processes of urbanization aren't constrained um, within the, the boundaries of our cities, but involve whole landscapes that may be within our province, they may be within our country, and they extend globally. This is the cover of a, a recent collection of essays um, by Neil Brenner at the Harvard Kennedy School, and it's no accident that he's put a picture of the oil sands there, because he says, that, you know, it's great that cities have climate mitigation strategies, it's great we have environmental strategies, but really if we want to address environmental issues, we have to understand the full extent to which our landscape is now involved in supporting processes of urbanization. So we have these kind of non-contiguous, they're not next to each other, far more abstract kind of relationships that further disrupt the kind of policy boundaries uh, we deal with. And then thirdly, and I won't talk about it too much because Bill already did a nice, you know, as soon as we start to change the boundaries and start to change the issues, we start to change the patterns of the partnerships and the actors involved in the relationships we deal with between municipalities, with stakeholders, uh, and across the different levels of government. Going forward, I think this is a little bit of what Mayor Iveson might have had in mind earlier this week when he posted the following statement up on his blog and arguing that, hey, cities are now growing up in our responsibilities, in our capacity to deal with them, and the province needs to recognize them as such. I'd like to shift now to talk about the second challenge facing the evolution of municipal governance. If our traditional definitions of the city are inadequate in understanding urbanization and today's urban challenges, and therefore, if our current systems of governments founded on these perceptions are themselves no longer adequate, how do we adapt to forge new understandings and new institutional forms of government? Experimentation and practice so far points to multiple pathways and routes to adaptation. However, um, they very often share elements of um, regional or polycentric um, types of planning. And so I'm going to focus on one um, specific and very um, topical and popular model of adaptation, and that's towards um, the, city re the city region. Uh, and it's been popular over the last 15 uh, to 20 years, although its roots go back to um, the early 20th century in uh, England and Germany. Um, at its most basic, the city region proposes a rescaling of the city um, Within, within the region, within the context of the wider region. And it follows that we adapt our urban boundaries and institutions of government accordingly. But it's not just a spatial fix. Um, the city region also carries a great deal of normative and political baggage with it. And it has become somewhat uh, of a conceptual repository for the types of cities we imagine and that we need for the future. So again, it's hard to find the ideal type of what the city region looks like in practice, but it does share some elements, or at least the arguments behind processes of city regionalism share some elements. Um, very often we talk about creating smart cities, smart planning, um, 
creating efficient cities that are responsible to global networks, creating economically competitive zones, competing within global uh, city region networks or, global, or networks of global cities. And we even talk about it as a means of, uh, of fostering um, democracy in an uncertain context where the role of the state and provincial uh, and federal bodies may not seem to have the democratic authority or links to our communities that they used to. So it's not only a spatial fix, it's not only about moving boundaries, but people talk about it with these wide range of kind of desires attached to it. The challenge then, as, as my colleague John Harrison in our book puts it, is, is to, to work through them. To, to determine what city region fits you and what aspects um, fit your community and your locality. Um, you have to determine what city region you want and where you want it. He puts it far more um, complicated in this following academic quote, quote, but I'll read it to you anyways. The task to make city regions complementary with existing forms of local, regional, and national state spatial organization requires different constructions of the city region concept to be developed at different scales, in different place, and at different times. And so the point there is about the difference. So how do you match these kind of broad ideas and concepts for how we adapt government with the places and communities um, where we're situated? So why is this important? Well, to date, um, we probably haven't done a very good of job of negotiating those hurdles. Um, instead, our, we focused, as, as Kevin Morgan, a, a planning scholar in, in Wales puts it, we focused on a very narrow range of assumptions and motivations for adapting our, our systems of municipal government. These generally boil down to efficiencies, and that we need to create more efficient systems of government so that we can be uh, more adaptable to, to a very rapidly changing global world. And they boil down to about how we become economically competitive. So uh, some scholars uh, suggest this is about, you know, businessing the city, or more cynically, it's about disciplining the city uh, as a, an institution of supporting global capitalism. Of course, those aspects are important, but they're not all of what a city is. A good example and perhaps where we can most evidently see this tension between how we define the city region is the kind of emphasis cities are now placing on their attractiveness. How do we look to attract the right kind of people to develop our economies, to take our cities forward? How do we um, create the kinds of contexts which will attract the business uh, to move within our, our, our boundaries and, and, and give us the revenues and the economy we want. And very often, these, the, the plans we adopt and our systems of government which support these things are based from the perspective of an external gaze. And I'll give you three examples, one of which I have up on a the slide there. Um, city branding, very topical. Most of you, I'm sure, have been involved in this. Um, usually, the city brands we... Um, this will work? We're good. How, am I almost out of time? No, good? Okay, so, so I don't have the picture here, but I'm sure you've seen it, the picture the Alberta government used to advertise Alberta with a picture of the Northumberland coast in Newcastle. Very often they present an image that we want others to see of ourselves as opposed to relating to who we are. The same can be made, statement has been made around kind of star architecture and creating bespoke buildings. We kind of put the the kinds of buildings in our city that we think will be attractive to knowledge workers, creative classes, or others to come in inside, but those buildings don't really fit within the architectural built environment of our cities, and they don't necessarily fit within the culture and identities. It's fantastic in Grand Prairie. If you haven't seen the college yet, go see it, because you have the opposite example of that, a piece of an architecture that makes sense in terms of place, identity, and culture. And of course, global ranking tables of city. I've put uh, Edmonton here. I, I looked up Grand Prairie and some of them as well. I see Grand Prairie is only the 51st most uh, uh, economically viable place to make a living in Canada. Uh, St. Albert did far better. Mayor Krause, where are you? My, my hometown of Terrace did very poorly because it rains a lot there. Um, but you have these ranking tables which pro provide a set of criteria upon which a city is based. And of course, that's great if they tell us a little bit about how our cities are doing. But very often, as Alan Smart has noted from the University of Calgary in a paper he's written for our book, those same processes start to structure how we respond. We plan and we adapt and we govern to meet the criteria of the table, as opposed to thinking about how the table reflects what we want uh, to be. So these are all examples of that tension of, of how we define our governance and adapt being shaped from the outside. Are there alternatives? 
Yes, we're certainly witnessing uh, currently a, cor a correct and growing emphasis on engaged and, and collaborative planning and governance. Engaged publics can support adaptation by placing government in relation to the local needs and understandings of communities. It's a reminder that cities are fundamentally social as well as territorial units involving cultures, identities, and their own unique virtues and desires for the future. Collaborative planning, planning through storytelling or narrative, engaging publics in the determinacy of futures of cities, and not only in the current conflicts of the day, are all minds, means by which it is possible to shape city regionalism and develop systems and territories of government which are appropriate to place in context. Up there, keeping with our Manitoba theme, is a, a wonderful piece of work done by Replan Planning Alliance um, and Michelle Dr Dryley, the senior planner there, on creating a community-based regional plan um, for the community of, around, of Thompson and its surrounding areas. Uh, Thompson at that time um, was facing the closure of a significant resource sector. Um, the mine thankfully put in some money to think about what were the economic futures of those areas. What's up on the screen there is a result of a community consultation um, with the communities of the area, with the stakeholders and with First Nations to think about how they build resiliency into their future economies. Uh, and working with a really terrific group of professional planners to do that. So it's an outcome of an engaged process. It fosters trust in the legitimacy in our, our branches of government by participation in the process, by participation in the experiment of doing regional government. It unites people through partnerships. It creates a unity and in, in direction going forward. And what was really important for this project was that it created a firm basis for those communities in the region to engage with other state levels, and particularly um, the, the province. So it's a good example of the kinds of um, detailed, professional, engaged kinds of thinking you can do as a community uh, around uh, regional planning. This brings me to my last slide. Oh, now I've probably gone too far. Um, what's exciting about the conversations we're having today? That within Alberta, we're seeing an explicit focus coming out of our cities really propelling these conversations forward, which focus on the city in terms of life and the life of the city. They deal with wider areas of prosperity and development and what it means to create the kinds of sustainable places that we want to live in the future. The Edmonton Way Wees may be ambitious, they may never be achieved um, in full, but they're a wonderful articulation of the kinds of city that Edmonton imagines it can be. Um, and we have an increasingly engaged and active urban community in this province that wants change, that is demanding something different, and is really interested in the cities and the cities of the future. So I hope what today's session will contribute to this discussion um, is really thinking about what urban governance looks like within a prairie context. Uh, in other words, what, how we can start to develop a locally and contextually situated kind of prairie urbanism um, in Alberta. And I think just these are slides I had one of my grad students put together. I said, hey, put together a little collage that shows the vitality and life um, that represents what you think is a prairie urban city. And I think it's a fantastic kind of collection of, uh, of, of what we are and, who, and what we're doing. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to thank everybody for coming up to GP here for uh, this conversation. I think it's long overdue and uh, appreciate everybody traveling up, uh, up here. I also want to acknowledge uh, Mayor Gibbon and uh, the Council and all the administration for, uh, for, for putting this together. And uh, it's fantastic that we can finally have a conversation about uh, this. Uh, oh, that, so most of you don't know, I'm not very techie, so uh, I... I uh, I don't know why they got me between two professors, which, uh, wow. <clears throat> if they knew how I passed grade 12, they'd be pretty impressed. Um, but uh, thank thankfully, it was the only year the Maple Leafs went far in the playoffs, and I gave my hockey tickets to my English teacher. Um, <laughs> true politician, eh? 17 years old, scamming. So, uh, so I, I don't have any pictures of, uh, of uh, any lake trout this year. Um, you know, Everett uh, talked about GP being the best place to live, so I don't have any big, big lake trout pitches this year. But, uh, you know, uh, I talked to the mayor here, and uh, he wanted me to be on this panel. I said, what do you want me to talk about? And he says, ah, you know, you got 10 minutes, uh, you know, just talk about what the community means to you. 
And so that's kind of what my presentation's about. Um, it's not going to be a lot of numbers in there for a change. But uh, um, I want you to know that, uh, for those that don't know me, um, I'm very blessed as mayor. I mean, uh, like they said, mayor since 07. But I've had uh, my council behind me and administration all the way. And, and so when I'm speaking, I'm actually, uh, I have everybody behind me. And it's uh, those that are mayors or Reeves, uh, uh, that is so vital. Um, and I just want to acknowledge them. Uh, I don't get to say it enough. But I also have the community behind me, which is, which is critical. Uh, we went on our journey with our community uh, back many years ago, for those that have followed us. And they've always been with us. And they're with us on this conversation also. And that's what's significant. We've had a major... Uh, change in the city of Coal Lake with the uh, industrial assessment coming from uh, from the air weapons range into the city, and people are now seeing what is what the journey was all about. But yet, yet they're willing to even have the conversation about changing the look of even our community to to, to make it a better place to live. Come on, so we'll kick uh, it up. So here's a since we're up in Grand Prairie, uh, those have seen this quote from me before. This is this man here, a former mayor up here. Um, what he said, uh, it was at an AUMA session in Edmonton uh, a long time ago, and he talked about the conversations that we're having right now. And uh, I was just a young counselor, a fish guy, didn't know what the heck what he was talking about, but I really recognized um, here's a leader, a mayor standing up in a big city and talking about the conversation we're having right now. And uh, I've always taken it that, that what I learned that day and carried it forward and try to understand uh, what he was talking about. And it's a great, it's a great quote. And uh, people of Grand Prairie should be proud of uh, what he was saying back then. So, like I said, Bill asked me, what does a community mean to me? So, you know, this is a little fun we had from our graphics people in the City Hall. But uh, this could be uh, any community in Alberta. And so, uh, for the Calgary people, they might recognize, it might be their skyline in the back, but... Uh, um, you know, we've got an oil derrick. I mean, where I'm from, that's pretty common. Uh, we've got some oil wells. We probably can put a coal mine in there for the Grand Cash guys just to feel at home. But, uh, you know, we've got a farm. We've got somewhere in there, there's a house. But the idea is that this is the community. Whether, you know, everybody's together to make a community a better place. The, the people that are living in downtown or Main Street uh, GP are going out to the country to maybe go fishing or go hunting. Uh, maybe recreate out there, maybe there's some sports facilities out there, and the, and the rurals are coming in, the farmers coming in to do his shopping and, and whatnot in, in, the, uh, in, in the city. The cows, well, we don't know what they're doing, they're just, yeah. But right now, this is what's going on in Alberta. Um, certainly some municipalities have a better, a better um, circles. Um, we talked about squares and circles yesterday at the mid-sized mayor's meeting, but but basically, in, in the two circles joining the urban, urban and rural, um, very little um, cooperation or integration between the two circles. And so the boundaries were governing each other's area separately, more or less. Uh, there definitely is cooperation in some areas, but more or less, it's a very narrow band of, of, uh, of togetherness, working together to make it a better place. And so, you know, up in... Uh, one of the things we feel um, needs to happen where is, uh, is a rural and urban are inside the circle together. And uh, that's kind of our vision, what a community looks like. And, uh, of course, uh, you know, that circle that where the urban is could be at the lower left of the circle. We just put it in the middle, depending on what that community looks like. I didn't do this. So, <clears throat> thanks, Kevin. Um, so, this is out of my league. And so, um, inside that community, of course, is where you live, uh, where you work, where you shop, where you recreate, meaning the sports facilities or going out fishing, hunting, school, healthcare, worship. There's so many points that could be put in that, that whole circle. Yeah, we do go to see the Edmonton Oilers lose and the Flames lose, but, but uh, you know, uh, getting there on the highways is a bit of a hazard now, but... but uh, you know, we do come to the city for, you know, better shopping or the theater or whatever, but more or less inside your community is where you do all those things. And so, you know, the vision that we have as community govern government is, uh, you know, urban, rural and urban residents uh, gov governing together and, and making it a better place to live. 
Our belief is that uh, we should be creating uh, kind of what uh, what's maybe happening in Manitoba is creating new municipalities. And, you know, because of the vastness of our, our province, it's tough to make some municipalities uh, 100,000 hectares. But certainly, uh, you know, we've got some big monster municipalities out there that got a lot of, lot of uh, land. But more or less, you know, somewhere between 100,000 hectares to 2 million hectares is kind of probably a good governing area. Basically, uh, an hour's drive, more or less, would be a good way to, to sort of describe it. It's more or less we work and live in an hour radius. And that's kind of what Wayne was saying back in 2006. That's what he described was, you know, basically everything sort of happens in an hour radius. And so inside that circle, of course, would be at least one urban center where uh, commerce would take a part, but sometimes there'd be multiple uh, urbans, you know, municipalities would be inside that community, and you could have a couple of towns, you could have a city, you may have two cities, but at least a minimum of inside that community would be one, you know, one urban where you could say, okay, this is the, the center node or whatever you want to call it, but at a minimum one, but it might be multiple, especially when you get around uh, certain areas in the big centers down in the... Uh, you know, close to the major cities, you could probably put a few people together to make it uh, one big community. So uh, most of you in the room know what we do uh, uh, as um, in the municipal world. So uh, a lot of this is uh, pretty common to everybody. Uh, we do all this level of service for the public and uh, for the for the ratepayers, and uh, you know all these uh, different uh, different bullets. Pretty common in our world. So right now, for municipalities, for the community, we have uh, funding from different, different sources. Certainly residential assessment is a big one, and uh, you could, in a community, look at it from a level of service. You could have a, a rural mill, mill rate. You could have an urban mill rate. Certainly, uh, you know, just a justification on fire alone, um, you know, the, the time it takes to go fight a fire out in the, out in the rural versus inside... Uh, in an urban is, is much different. So you could have uh, uh, you know, a mill rate that was split. You could uh, look at a, a commercial mill rate and a non you know, an industrial type of mill rate. Of course, uh, part of your funding is from farmlands and uh, rail lines. We also have the good old province. It's given us some money in different forms and we have uh, something called the federal government. And uh, they're giving us uh, money through gas tax, et cetera, but the idea here, and of course the big one for a lot of urbans is user fees. And so the idea, what I'm trying to sort of say is we're going to put all the funding from all the different sources into one big community government and it's going to pull, you know, make some decisions. And this is the revenue that's coming in for that community. We're working together. So here's where I've thrown a couple of left, some balls out there and because uh, that's who I am. And um, so um, I think there's a lot of, um, you know, when we're really going to have this conversation, um, there's this real fear in the room about rural and urbans and, and getting together. But I think if you look at it from the, from, from the people that we serve, they don't care where, who's governing them. They just want quality level of service. And I, my argument is, is that why are we stopping at what we currently are doing? I mean, why don't we look at the provincial government downloading the money and, and us at the local level, the community level, making some good, hard decisions for our community, schools, education, health? Why are we limiting ourselves to just this box they got into us? I think we could do a much better job making decisions on hospitals, funding our hospital. I don't know about you guys, but our hospital sucks. And, and you know, it, 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 nothing has happened since my whole time I'm mayor, I still got a tired building. We are overcrowded. We've got some of the highest uh, emergent, emergency visits per capita in all of Alberta, and nothing has changed. And so what if funding came down to the local level so that as the community council could make some hard decisions and say, you know what, we are going to expand this wing of, of a hospital. We are going to do this thing. We are going to build a school. And that's where we need to go because right now all we're doing is going around and talking to the education minister and the health minister and fighting as, as municipalities to get our school and our community. And I argue that the bureaucracy 
in these, in these departments can be reduced. If funding flowed right to the community level, we can make some hard decisions for the betterment of our community. And it's something to think about. Like I look at, uh, there's a lot of mayors here that I work with, at the mid-sized mayors, ambulance. Man, why is an ambulance inside that community box where we can, we can control ambulance delivery inside that community? It's all about funding flowing to the right people, and right now it's not. You know, seniors care, social housing, these are all kind of discussions that, uh, you know, really we need to think outside the box and do more. I think we can do more as local politicians. We're right on the, we're right on the ground. People interact with us far more than any. You know, when you talk to former, uh, to MLAs that used to be mayors and Reeves, they were more engaged at the real local issues than they are now as MLAs and as MPs. And, and, and that's, that's who we are. We, 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 we have more of a footprint on our community. So let's talk about the world according to Craig. And so the, here's, here's the community as I see it. Um, I don't know about the name. Bonnie will get in the first choice, but it's alphabet, and I, I did pass that subject. So, you know, you got Bonneville Cold Lake, and uh, so if this is what it looked like, you got a population of just over 33,000. We probably got about 5,000 temporary workers uh, with the oil patch that uh, are embedded in the community when they don't do census and they don't pay Alberta tax. So the, uh, the area is it's huge, a million, million hectares. We have uh, a city, uh, of course, Coal Lake. We've got a town, town of Bonneville. We've got a village, Glendon, and we've got a couple summer villages. And of course, uh, the MD has quite a, quite a high rural population, especially around the, uh, around the urbans. So our total assessment, if you looked at it, you know, 2012 numbers, you know, it was a lot of money, $8.1 billion. A lot of, a lot of change there to, to really make your community strong. So 57% of that assessment is residents. And something that the conversation needs to go is, is that we always talk about linear, we always talk about M&E, but man, there's a ton of, of a, a residential assessment out there that those people are, want to make the community a better place to live. And they want their taxes flowing in to make the quality of life that much better. So for, for the community of Coal Lake, it's uh, $256,000 per person of assessment. I see some Edmonton and Calgary councillors here. I mean, you're, you're floating around about one eighty, dollars $180,000 per capita in assessment. Um, and so this is pretty significant money. For Coal Lake before the air weapons range deal, we were about $110,000 per capita. And so I know there's a lot of small play, uh, players here, vill villages and towns here today. You know, they're floating around ninety to 100000 per, per capita of funding. And when, when you've got 1,000 people in your community, your, your community budget, it doesn't really go very far. So inside that community, we would be running two hospitals. And we would have three senior lodges, and we'd have 25 schools. And I'll guarantee you, we'll have more schools than 25 if the f dollars flowed to our community. And so the other day, we, ha we have a brand new school opening up, and I went to the uh, presentation, and I said, what, what's this, uh, this, this wing here? He's got two wings coming off the main school. He said, oh, those are modules. I said, modules? And, uh, yeah, when your community population goes down, we can just take the modules and move them somewhere else and go, we're growing at 9.3% uh, in two years. Like, where do you see the city of Coal Lake going down in population? And I guarantee you, if the council, the community council, had designed that school, they would never even have had that conversation. But somebody is allowed in the current system to make these kind of decisions for our local people, and it's outrageous. And that's what I'm saying, we should be thinking way outside the box, because Bill said I could, is, is, uh, is look at more than what we actually are doing right now, and look at health, look at education, look at seniors' lodges, because all we do right now is go to the media and, and beak off. And I'm saying, put the money, and we'll make local decisions. So let's see if this works, right, Kevin? So here's a, here's a leader that got it back in the day when we were kids or as parents. This was the real person that knew about what I'm talking about. Let's see if it would work. Oh, did I lose it? So how do I make him speak? Thanks. Uh -oh. 
It's supposed to be going up to some YouTube leak, link, or whatever, however you do that. Of course, the, the person that we're talking about, for those that aren't from here, <clears throat> Mr. Rogers. So he, uh, everybody knows the theme, and uh, he was a visionary, and uh, I think he has it, uh, you know, everybody knows the theme of his song, and, and really that, uh, oh well, are we not going to make it? Anyways, everybody knows the words, but won't you be my neighbor, right? I haven't had any drinks today, so... Uh, Last night at the Sharks Club, I probably would have sang it, but not now in front of all you people. And, and they're probably taping me. So anyways, so won't you be my neighbor, right? So it's a great song. Go back home, and uh, really that should be the theme. And uh, anyways, thank you. And, and, and please uh, identify yourself, where you're from. Uh, Bruce Routley, uh, Center for Research and Innovation at the college. My question is to uh, Craig. Uh, first, a quick comment. Um, I live in Avondale, which is uh, within a walking distance of downtown, and we are a Know Your Neighbor neighborhood. We've just uh, put our banners up, and we're very proud of that. I w would like you to speak just a little bit longer about the difference between community governments versus regional governance. You, you've raised the point. I just want to hear a little bit more about that. Should I, do these work? Okay. Basically, it's the same thing. Um, in, in, in my world, uh, for those that know, I used to say regional government. A lot of people don't like that word. So, um, and then does the public understand what regional government means? So if you w use the word community, uh, that might help. Because it's all about the messaging and, and uh, under, the under, you know, describing it to the general public. Is what, it, what does regional government mean? I know Strathcona is in the room and that. We specialize municipality. I mean, yeah, you know. You could go that route, the word special, but I, I think if you, uh, I like the word community because we're all in. And uh, one thing I didn't say is that uh, if you talk to the, the people that run the big oil companies or coal mine or whatever, when they're paying a lot of tax, they, they want to see their, their taxes staying inside the community. And they look at a community as all in, just like what the presentation was. Is it's a big, huge, their people live inside that community, whether you're urban or rural. And, and so I think just to massage it better, I, I like the word community. It means the same thing. Lost. <laughs> I'd like to hear from uh, all three gentlemen the same question. I think Alberta has about 350 municipalities. You guys are all talking about the same idea, making bigger uh, municipalities. How many do you think we might end up with in Alberta if we were to go through the process that you saw in Manitoba or or processes that you, uh, that you envision uh, and talked about, Craig? If, if we were to use the numbers in Manitoba, we went from 106 down to 47. So if you've got over 300, when I was here working with municipal affairs, we had 100 or 303. Um, the number of municipalities have grown, but you're, you'd be looking at you know, something around just over 100. Um, I, I, again, I think uh, part of the, the magic, it, it's not about numbers, it's about how, how do you create those fundamental relationships both in territory and that social geography to be able to make it work. Um, so that's the beginning of the conversation. Um, well, David, uh, I, I should have thought about this one, but I'm going to wing it. I think it's, because uh, it, probably somebody was going to ask this. So the issue you have is, uh, you're from Edmonton, is um, in the conversation, you've got to figure out what you're going to do with Edmonton and Calgary. And so put that aside, and then if we're not talking about uh, amalgamating Edmonton or Calgary with anybody, then I would say the number's going to land somewhere between 50 and 75. Um, but what really has to be understood is, is um, some of our urban sit inside rural districts, or whatever you want to call them, that don't make a lot of sense if you were to merge them. And so you need to look at this uh, at a, from a transportation uh, way of getting around your, your community. And so um, I didn't really talk about that in the community, you know, in, in my presentation, but that's going to be vital. Uh, for example, say Sundry uh, may be better efficiently aligned with Rocky Mountain House uh, than necessarily to the, to the east. So you have to look at everything from a perspective and also how big should the municipality be? And so 
you know, a million acre, hectares is huge. Um, and so, you know, what makes sense? And I think when we have the big conversation, uh, we may be narrowing these, these municipalities to be more efficient. And especially when you get in the greater population of maybe pooling 100,000 people together, say you get down north of Calgary and you get in that Airdrie, uh, Chestermere, blah, blah, blah area, you're starting to throw in a lot of population. So how big is big? But I would say 50 to 75 if I'm a betting person. Yeah, I've never gone through and, and counted and recounted, but I think what both other panelists have said, said applies. It's, it's not a numbers game, and what really matters is, is what makes sense. I think it, it's, it's not a helpful um, a, approach to go through and do some, a form of blanket amalgamation or, uh, or similar to what we might have understood to have happened in Ontario. Really, there's an opportunity in where the conversation about reform is coming from in this province to allow communities and to allow the municipalities to work with the province and other levels of government to figure out what makes sense to create the kinds of communities um, that they want in their region. So I, I'm, I'm much happier to leave it open than to than, than to, to try to create a blanket kind of pronouncement about what we should have or what the appropriate scale or size of a city should be. Please. Hi. Dan Wong with BL, BLK Engineering. I'm also a former councillor for this city. Um, when you're talking about conglomerating municipalities, um, there is a fear that the individual municipalities within the region will lose their identities. Can you comment on whether or not that is or is not the case? If we're going to start again, um, I think it was central in the Manitoba conversation around that notion of identity, and that's where um, I think identity is often a piece of history, and it's and and it can in fact how, how do you move that that his, history story to the future, and that's where at least in Manitoba that conversation around reconfiguring the the territory is the beginning conversation. I'd also like to add that. Um, that maybe it's not necessarily about changing the territory, but it's changing the governance structure. So, um, and again, one of the suggestions might be to look at Quebec. Um, I, two years ago, I spent three weeks in Quebec looking at how they, how they govern regions and they keep their local identity, they keep their local municipalities, but the, the mayors and elected officials were able to actually put propositions together to the provincial government to in fact enable some of that funding to, to flow down, but they had to reach agreement on priorities and investments locally, regionally if you will, and, and regionally they would caucus to talk about government in terms to try to figure out how they were going to move forward. And I think there are some municipal regional lessons elsewhere in Canada that can be transferred to this conversation. And there's mechanisms already existing in Quebec, for instance, to do this. Um, both at the regional level as well as at the uh, provincial level to make sure they, one, they get heard, and secondly, they get funded. I, 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 don't, I think it was Dan, was it? Uh, I don't think there's no fear. I don't think you're going to lose your identity. Um, you're going to lose your identity if you can't afford to build a hockey arena. Um, you know, like, if we became one big community with, with Bonneville, um, Maybe we'd get a junior A hockey team. But, uh, you know, uh, in, you know, Cold Lake and Bonneville rivalry would be fantastic. I don't know if anybody here is from major junior hockey, but, boy, we got a nice arena. But uh, I got the mic. I don't think there's any, there's, I don't think there's any, any fear of losing your identity. It's going to be up to the community council to ensure that the, whatever the shape of your community government, rural and urban, both move forward the same way. And I, I don't think there's any fear of, of this at all. I think the only ones that, that I've met that are fearful, to be quite frankly, are the politicians. Yeah, I, th I think that, that's right. And I'll just make two, two responses. First is we tend to talk um, in very simple categories when we talk about identities. And usually in this context, it's the rural versus the urban, or as somebody told me I was the other day, a city it, which is, which is, which is great, some tensions, even though I come from a rural area. Um, That's so, so between rurals and city it's, um, this clearly doesn't reflect the dynamic changes in our communities and in our cultures and in the demographic makeup of our cities or who we're becoming or what we're becoming. It's, it's a simple argument um, to cover all kinds of tensions in those relationships. So our communities 
and it's plural, we don't have single community, are adapting and changing, and our systems of government need to reflect those changes. But how do you build trust and legitimacy and buy-in into that process? That's why in my presentation I came down to say you, it's really the long road. It's through experimentation and engagement and dialogue. Dialogue doesn't mean everybody needs to agree with each other, but it's in a forum for sharing differences, for sharing, you know, in, in those kind of peri-urban fringes where the rural and the urban come together. It's about talking about the, change, the, the, the challenges, preserving agriculture land, preserving natural resources, preserving recreation areas, what the value of those are to local uh, peoples that live in those areas, what they are to the city. It's about having those difficult conversations, um, and, and that's really you know, the way to get around that conversation, uh, you know, that simplistic kind of division between the rural and the urban is, is to have those open conversations and have our municipalities lead them.